Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to our council meeting this evening. Um, again, can I just uh, remind everybody um, that the meeting has been sh uh, shown live and will be stored for later viewing. Um, uh, I do have the ability to suspend filming, um, as you know, if anybody misbehaves, but I'm sure that you won't. So, welcome. I um, can also welcome uh, Anne-Marie Kennedy, um, her family and her guests here this evening for a, a lovely event which will come to shortly. And can also welcome um, Group Manager Paul Devlin from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Welcome Mr Devlin. So, do we have any apologies for absence this evening? Thank you Provost. One apology from Deputy Provost Cunningham. Thank you very much. Um, what I, I would now, uh, well, firstly, declarations of interest. Can I take any declarations of interest? Councillor Grant? Uh, yes, I am a member of the Le Leisure Trust Board. Okay. And I'm a Leisure Trust Board. Okay, can we note those declarations of uh, interest? Thank you. Now, what I would propose to do here uh, this evening, um, understanding Order 19, is just to simply alter um, the business as follows. Um, I would like to take item number 12 first, the Strenfisher Local Fire and Rescue Plan. Well, we'll take that after item number 3 um, when we uh, deal with the award uh, to Mrs Kennedy. And item 15, the financial controls will be taken. Item uh, after item 7 and the items remitted to the council and this will of course um, principally for item 12 allow Mr Devlin to um, get home a wee bit earlier rather than have to sit through the whole council meeting which I'm sure will be appreciated ok um, we now come to item number 3 which is the presentation of the Provost Award to Anne-Marie Kennedy. Um, colleagues, I, I feel particularly um, honoured to be presenting this year's Citizens of the Award to such a dedicated and passionate lady um, who has contributed massively to a number of lives across East Renfrewshire. Um, I know Anne-Marie fairly well, I've worked with Anne-Marie over a long period of time and I guess most of us um, know Anne-Marie, um, certainly if you're from the Barhead area, if you represent Bar, uh, any of the Barhead or Nielsen wards, you would know Anne-Marie very well, but I think most of us will know Anne-Marie for her work throughout the area. Um, particularly to highlight her work for the community transport um, and also the, as Chair of East Renfrewshire Voluntary Action. Um, she's a regular attender at our community planning partnership meetings, which we often have um, before the councils. Um, in fact, she's probably got a much better attendance record than some of our councillors, I have to say, at that. Um, but she's been dedicating many years of her life to um, promoting good deeds um, within the, the whole East Renfrewshire area. And I think for more than 17 years, um, you've now been involved in voluntary action, um, which is really quite remarkable. And uh, those of us who have been involved in the CHCP as was and now the HSCP and all the debates about community transport and how we get to our new health centres, Anne-Marie has done an absolutely sterling job um, in promoting transport and allowing uh, people and patients to have appointments at the health centre and don't have um, access to either public transport or their own cars um, to actually um, make those um, medical appointments. She manages something like 47 volunteer drivers and the service offers transport to medical appointments and all sorts of other activities um, throughout the area. Also does work reducing um, loneliness and keeping people connected to the local community. Anne-Marie has successfully raised funds for three accessible people carriers, ensuring those 
um, that who are less able in our society can get out and about and enjoy the local activities which we have in East Renfrewshire. Our volunteers have contributed more than 11,400 hours alone and a thousand individuals have benefited from this fantastic charity. She's very passionate about patient welfare and has championed the voice of East Renfrewshire residents in health and care. Anne-Marie has taken part in cleanliness inspections of hospital wards, has been the patient representative on different hospital and speciality working groups, and for many years has chaired a local patient user partnership group. And as I say, she's a well kent face to those of us who have been on the HSCP and CHCP before that. This is only really a fraction of the work that Anne-Marie Kennedy has done for her local community. And this is by definition just a very short summary and a synopsis of, of the work that she has done over many, many years. So on behalf of the people of East Renfrewshire, I'm absolutely delighted to recognise Anne-Marie in this fashion. Um, and she truly deserves to be our Citizen of the Year. So congratulations, Anne-Marie, and well done. And thank you for all you did. Okay, colleagues, can we move on with the, the rest of the business here this evening? And could I move on to item number four, which is the minute of the 25th of October. And again, the minute is submitted for approval and signature. I'll do the minutes then, I'll do number five. Sorry about that. Um, keep you waiting a bit longer, Mr. Devon. Um, the minute item five, uh, well, do, do we do the minute volume first? Yeah. I, I would take Mr. Okay. Benwin first, okay. Provost, and then you can move on to the minute okay, volume. I'll be very kind to you, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Bevlin, by allowing you to leave. There's probably other things on this evening you'd rather be doing than, than sitting here. I do appreciate that. So, can we take the, the fire agenda item, which... Um, is in front of you, which is uh, item number 12, okay, on your agenda papers. The report has already been to Cabinet, but happy to... Do you want to say anything to the report, first of all, Mr Bevan? Thank you, Provost. Just to advise you, obviously, this has been to Cabinet already. This is our plan moving forward for East Renfrewshire, we'll be obviously for the next kind of three to five years. It gives you a strategic overview of what we intend doing in terms of, obviously, the reductions in terms of un kind of intentional harm, kind of fire casualties, accidental fires and the likes of that. 
obviously on an annual basis we'll also have an operational plan which will specify exactly how we tend to do that and all of the, all, all, everything we do will also support the local outcome improvement plan as well which is coming in to being as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will open it up for any questions or comments. No, none. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I thank you again, Mr. Devlin? Thank you for your attendance here this evening. Now moving on to the minute volume. Um, of item 4, again the minute of the 25th of October for noting. Item 5, the minute of the 21st of November, again for approval and signature. Item 6, the minute volume, 26th October to 12th of December. Councillor Grant. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, if I could go to the uh, minute of the meeting on the 7th of December uh, with the regard to the Eastwood Leisure Centre oblique campus. Um, I have two points I'd like to raise. I think they're very important. Number one, um, who will be uh, consulted? Um, this is a very important issue and I think it's very important that we get the widest possible consultation, not just the usual suspects, but the whole community has got to have an input and I would really like to get some assurances uh, that this will be carried out in the widest possible way. And my second point is um, um, when you're putting forward the four options, the option four should have, along with all the details that we have here in the paper for option four, that it should also s state the list that we have here of possible sites that might be considered if there was to be a new build. And I think that's particularly important because I think if people are looking towards the idea of a completely new build, they have to have some idea of where it may or may not be. And I think if you didn't put these suggestions forward, then it, it would really, option four, it wouldn't be fair. I think that's the word I would use. It wouldn't be fair. And I think I'm looking for assurances that that will be carried out. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Councillor Merrick, just to outline the consultation process? Yeah. Well, uh, of course, the, the consultation process, before we've decided on that, will come before the full Council anyway, and, and we'll discuss these options there and, and, and what you've said also. Provost, can I just come in on that? Um, on the first point from Councillor Grant, I'm quite happy to say I'm in consultation with Emma Edwards, our PR manager, about the actual consultation process. It was my intention that, on behalf of the Council that that consultation process will be as wide as possible. I didn't use the term the usual suspects. I want to involve clubs, schools, members of the public, everybody that's got an interest in it. In relation to option four, I'm happy to consider your points. Um, it, it might well be possible to give an indication of some of the sites that we might be looking to consider, but it would also have to make it clear that there are these sites potentially that haven't been put on that list as yet, but it would have to be absolutely and utterly crystal clear it's not a consultation on the sites itself, if that makes sense. I, I, I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr Cahill, and I appreciate that, and I, I do understand that there could be other possible sites, but I think it is... Uh, it is the right thing to do to, to give some indication to the public of possibilities. And I, I realise it might not be uh, a, an exact list, but I do feel that people, if they're going for option four, should realise what they're thinking about in a broader sense, perhaps. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, I have to concur with what uh, Councillor Grant is saying there. I have to say that the communication uh, in terms of the future of Eastwood Leisure Centre has been absolutely shocking. Uh, we started, we actually brought it to the, the Council many years ago, a proposal about getting investment into the Eastwood Leisure Centre. 
And then when it was taken over by the, the trust, they were very quick to establish what we all knew already, that there was a complete lack of investment in that building. Uh, I've had a number of communications with officers and with the Leisure Trust, and I have to say the Leisure Trust have been extremely forthcoming. But uh, we had expected to have a paper come to Council last February, I believe, and that was held up. And I wonder why it was held up, and I'm just curious as to whether it was perhaps the elections. I certainly remember a councillor in uh, Giffnick and Thornley Bank put out a leaflet uh, talking about, uh, not, uh, he was very concerned about the continual erosion of services in Giffnick and Thornley Bank, uh, not least the threatened closure of the swimming pool being a case in point. Now, that actually got a number of uh, emails started coming through, and there was one that was sent to Councillor Fletcher and myself, and this was from a resident who was seeking some clarification because we had heard of the six million that the council was going to put forward, but there was no mention of this was going to go towards uh, the swimming pool. And the response that uh, Councillor Fletcher, who was leader of the council at the time, stated, it is difficult to imagine why any local politician would wish to lose the pool facility in the area, and I can only conclude that those who wish to scaremonger about the future of the pool do so for their own malicious political reasons. I can only speak for myself and my party, that would be the Labour Party I'm assuming, and would confirm for the umpteenth time that there is an absolute determination to ensure that the pool in Eastwood Park will be refurbished or rebuilt for the ongoing benefit of our local residents. I trust this clarifies the position for you. Now, I'm sure everybody that read that will now realise that that was as clear as mud because we seem to have a number of option appraisals here which is actually taking the pool out with Eastwood Park, which I understand was something that uh, the leader of the council at the time was assuring residents that that would not be the case, that money would be invested in the building in Eastwood Park for our local residents. Now, since then, we have had uh, Councillor Merrick, who has quite admittedly, he has always stated that it would be on the Eastwood side. So, natural reaction would be when that clearly states that not Eastwood Park would not be necessarily the number one proposal. Now, what Councillor Grant is asking for here is that if Eastwood Park is an option, my understanding is that the footprint will be too big for Eastwood Park. Is there an option that those who wish that pool to remain in Eastwood Park, that they could perhaps have a different design that allows it to stay here? Thank you. Well, I will respond since you've been mentioning my name specifically. Um, Councillor Wallace, I'm very happy to stand by the statements I and other other councillors or candidates can speak for themselves, um, but there was considerable malicious rumour about the facility closing, and it was quite clear as leader of the administration that we wished to ensure that there was a facility continuing in the Eastwood Park. I'm quite comfortable, I, as a local councillor, my preference would be that the facility is situated near the ward that I represent, but for the, the most people do travel to the facility, and I think it's far more important to get a site that gives the maximum possible facilities for local people in the whole of the area. Now, that may or may not be in Eastwood Park, but I think it's incumbent on us all to look at what are the best options for the area and to the best for local people rather than get hung up about whether it's in Eastwood Park or not in Eastwood Park. But it is a consultation, and I've got no problem whatsoever about having these options being available for people to comment on. I don't know if uh, anybody would wish to comment further on that. Councillor Swift. Question in the minute volume, I, I would remind you. Do you have a question in the minute volume? I have several questions on the minute volume, Councillor Fletcher. This is your opportunity. Thank you very much. Do you know, 50% of the comments in the local development plan, which uh, is in the papers in front of us, relate to objections to building on Broome Park, uh, which Councillor Grant has raised. It is important that we let people know 
that where these options are. So I'm just reinforcing that I think it is crucial that we let people know. Um, I subsequently had a conversation with the local community council about this paper, uh, which came up, and they said they were all horrified, unanimously horrified, that we could be building on Broom Park when it was clearly obvious. And I, I thought, are you coming to the question? I am coming to the question. So that's one of the things. So I, I think what what's the question? I've got, all right, do you want me to go straight to the questions and, and cut with... All right. Questions in Broome Park. What is the question you have in Broome okay. Park based on the minute? What is the question I have in Broome Park? I would like to know, the question is, I would like to know that, the, that, that is in, as per Councillor Grant, that the locations are going to be in the consultation. Do you, I mean, do you wish, are you talking about the swimming pool in Broome Park? Is that the concern? I'm talking about the whole leisure centre potentially being in Broome Park or mm. the Shaw, Shawwood uh, grassy area, right. which well, are two of the options. I, I think Mr Cahill has been fairly clear that it's a consultation and is going to be as open and transparent as we can possibly make it. Okay. Now, I, I'm not going to say whether it's the, the right place or the wrong place or whatever. It's an option which people can comment on. Okay. Now, I have got a range of questions now that I'd like to get to. Um, I, I'd like to make a quote from one of the, from the paper and then ask a question. It's a short quote. In response to the overall situation, the Council in February 2015 made provision within its general fund capital plan of £6 million for the refurbishment of Eastwood Park. It goes on a wee bit about how that's fund phased. However, and this is the important bit, however, it was always envisaged that a higher level of funding would be required. And this investment was earmarked as a, as a minimum, recognising that once the trust was formed, a further review would be required. My problem with that is, why are we just putting in a minimum lowball number when that doesn't reflect reality into our capital plan? That then suggests to me that the rest of our capital plan couldn't be entirely rubbish. That's the question. Why did we put six million in instead of 12 or 11 million for refurbishment of the pool? Well, as my understanding of it, it's been a long-standing marker in the capital plan, um, which you have had the opportunity when these capital plans are discussed to make those points if you feel it's not large enough. We, we never have enough money in our capital programme to do all the things we would like to do as elected members. So therefore, things which are in the capital programme, which covers a period of eight years, um, will invariably have various markers in them. I mean, fundamentally, I'm not a surveyor. I cannot go and check a building out with any degree of professional competence. So, I mean, to, to say to me that I might be able to go and, and raise something and not be sure that you are being accurate or the council are being accurate in what they're putting in the capital plan, I have to make an assumption that on the best evidence available to me, which is the information that's put in front of me, that that is correct. I, I think that's not an unreasonable thing to say, and I don't think I really understand why six million for uh, just keeping the pool where it is has become 11 million just to keep it where it is. Yeah. You will find that almost everything in the capital programme will not reflect estimates which are years in advance. So a mark in the capital programme which establishes that the council has a commitment to either rebuild or refurbish. But I think as has been said many times before, that was a minimum figure. And inevitably, if we are talking about the Rolls-Royce option for the people of East Renfrewshire and a full-blown um, new pool facility, of course it's going to cost more than £6 million. But it'll be up to councillors themselves whether they choose a refurbishment, choose a new build or whatever. Why was the building not adequately okay, okay. maintained? That's why I told you to chuck it. I'm not sure we would accept Pen. that, but I mean... More to the... Well, I think that's conjecture, but... Um... Yes, okay. yes. Uh, and it's a show... We have been consulting on a programme of cuts, uh, so why would we even consider option four, which will cost the equivalent of another £8 million in revenue cuts over three years? Uh, 
or an additional 31% of cuts to education care of the elderly, people with learning difficulties, etc., assuming the Council's estimates for revenue from the option 4 are as accurate as their forecast of costs, why would we be trying as a Council to make things much worse? I don't think that's an appropriate question. It's a consultation. You may have a view on what should tumble out of that consultation, but that clearly is not enough. You know, the, the paper is quite clear on what the consultation is, and what you're asking um, I don't think is appropriate in terms of what's in that particular paper. Can I rephrase the question? Brief, please. I will be brief. Can we rephrase? I'm rephrasing the question. Mr. Cahill, can we in the consultation put the costs in and the revenue implications of the costs in? Because there is an opportunity cost to borrowing, and I don't believe the revenue that's likely to be generated from the report. So I think rather than put anything that's just revenue related, I think it would be better to have something that, that is attributed, that fully attributes the costs to it, if I may. The information's in the public domain. I don't see why that shouldn't be included in it. To the minutes. Councillor. Sorry, this is to say if the proposed public consultation um, on the pool is not presently consulting about the locations, if that's a fact that it's not going to be in the public consultation, my question is when will the location be a question that's going out to public consultation? As, as I understand it, there's several um, sites like in Newton Mearns and in Clarkston and in various places, not, not in Giffnock anymore. So Again, the question is, what, you know, when will the public be consulted about the proposed new location of the, of the swim pool? No. Thanks, Provost. Firstly, it would be up to the Council to determine which site and which option they wish to pursue after the public consultation. Regarding any consultation with regard to the site, that's a function of the planning process. Evelyn. Please move on. Very liberal of people have questions. As long as it's qu can you please, if you have questions, relate them to the minute. Councillor Wood. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, just to ask, firstly, the minute of the Education Committee on the 16th of November 2017, uh, is that a true and accurate minute? The whole minute, or is there a particular issue in the, the paper? Yeah, but the whole minute, to begin with. Yeah. Is that is what you're asking? a true and accurate minute? Well, I'm told yes. It's just been approved. So presumably if it wasn't accurate, you'd have raised your concern then. Well, I'm going to ask it now. No, not then. I'm going to ask it now, which is, I'm just very surprised that it is a true and accurate minute, and I can't believe it is. Uh, the reason I say that is, uh, we've got in the Herald today it's saying about a gap between rich and poor pupils widens in primary schools, etc., and then we have in this minute, Councillor Buchanan, who I have to say I'm absolutely delighted to say that he announced uh, that he, and he made particular mention of the clear evidence that the attainment gap between pupils from the most deprived areas and those from the more affluent areas was being closed, which I think was terrific news for all councillors concerned, uh, and that's exactly what we are, are aiming for. I have to say that the frustration came from... Um, a following paragraph in there, and it was to Councillor Lafferty, who quite rightly uh, commented on the higher level of deprivation in St Luke's High School compared to Barhead High School, whilst pointing out that St Luke's consistently outperformed Barhead High in the SQA results. That's something I, I, I'm sure I even made mention, not maybe not at the last meeting, but a meeting prior to that, about the terrific results that St Luke's is getting and we're putting that down to a tremendous investment uh, that was going on. If I just want to come to this now, and, and it is leading to a question. It said that in response to uh, this, uh, the Barhead High School, and in response to Councillor Lafferty, Dr Ratter, supported by the director, explained that this was due to the catchment area of St Luke's High, incorporating the Nielsen area, which, although it contained areas of deprivation, also contained a number of relatively affluent areas. So what that minute is telling us is that the reason why St Luke's is doing particularly well is to do with the catchment area and nothing to do with the 
record of uh, achievement within that school and the manner in which they are being taught and the manner in which the kids are putting the effort in. I need clarification here. It looks down to, as it suggests in the minute here, the fact that the pupils are coming from a more affluent area, or is it down to other methods by which the council is endeavouring to close that gap? Thank you. Well, we are talking about the minute, and I guess the minute encapsulates what people said at the meeting. Um, so that's what the minute should reflect. But I don't know if Mrs Shaw um, wishes to comment on it or uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Happy to promise. It's both, in actual fact. I, I, and indeed, um, I, I know you're not a member of Education Committee any longer, and, and, and much to my regret, Councillor Wallace, you would have noted that Barhead had actually outperformed St Luke's in many measures uh, in the SQA examinations last year. But there's no hiding from the fact that youngsters coming from families with more affluence are more likely to do well. Uh, and of course, our, our endeavours, as you've noted earlier, is about making sure that we try as best we can to close that attainment and poverty-related attainment gap. And the evidence was shown to the Education Committee that that is indeed what we're doing. OK, do we have any other questions in the minute volume? Can we move on? Accept them. Thank you very much. Um, moving on then to item number seven, which is remitted items uh, from the Cabinet to the Council. First one, Interim Treasury Management Report. Sorry, from the Audit and uh, Scrutiny Committee. Can I invite uh, any questions or comments on that? Professor Miller? The only thing I'd comment on is the, the fact that um, some of the organisations approved for investment in surplus funds. I'm having now some second thoughts about the Santander group after they've shut the Clarkson store. Went above, went above everybody's head. I think we'll just leave it there. Um, okay. No other questions in that paper. Can I move to... Sorry. Page 45. How, um, it, I can't seem to find the number of... Uh, it's to do with complaints, and there are a large number of complaints, and, and it, broadly it looks reasonably consistent with the last year, but I can't find the number of complaints that were upheld by the SPSO in here. And maybe there were none, which is fine. Is that the next one? Oh, my apologies, I'm getting ahead of myself, promise. Nothing new there. Okay. I was trying to go on to the second item, but I think we've got your question on the second item. <laughs> if anybody wishes to respond to that. Mrs. Ennis, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I need to double-check, but I believe it's because it's a mid-year report rather than an end-year report, but I can double-check that and and get back to you later. Thank you very much. We're going to item three. Going back to page 45 once again, the, the customer satisfaction measures, and I noticed uh, all the measures there, are, are, almost all the measures are, are down in last year. Again, hopefully it's just a mid-year. That is correct, yes. We'll see an improvement at the end of the year. That's fine, thank you very much. Mm. Okay, um, what are we item? Sorry? Yeah. The General Fund Capital Programme, third one. Any questions on that one? Uh, item four. Sorry, apologies. Just one. Uh, going back to, to the other topic we talked about where there was a, a, you know, an 85% uh, degree of inaccuracy in the costs attributed to the pool, would it be possible to understand how confident uh, the Council can be in the estimates that are in our capital plan? Well, there are estimates, but Mrs McCrossan, do you want to provide any comfort? Yeah, yes, Provost. Um, there are a number of ways where we try to provide assurance about the estimates. Um, we have to plan very far in, a, far in advance for capital projects, so at the point that a capital project is um, designed, the, the best estimate is given and 
both revenue and capital costs are slotted into the relevant revenue or capital budgets. Where the capital budget is a number of years in advance, the Corporate Asset Management Group and particularly the Property and Technical um, Services team will review the costs every year and ensure that if it has to be updated prior to the project starting, that that is done. And you'll also see that the format of the capital monitoring reports has in recent years been updated so that a substantial increase in narrative information on the progress of projects that are in train is now provided so that you're constantly being updated on both progress and costs on every individual project. As regards uh, page 55, and uh, it's to do with the city deal, um, apparently we've spent uh, 1.6 million almost. Uh, oh, sorry, no, we've spent 100,000 pounds on uh, on, the, on the new railway station in Barhead, but we've spent sorry, <laughs> we've spent 580,000 on the, the incubator as well. I would I'd be keen to understand what we've got for that 700,000 almost that we've spent. Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, thank you, Provost. Yeah, work is ongoing. Obviously, the incubator units in Barhead uh, are up and fully operational and functional, I believe, fully occupied. Um, the aspect in terms of the new train station, rail station, is ongoing works. There's been works ongoing with both Scottish Water and indeed as recently as uh, yesterday at the Glasgow City Region Deal Cabinet, the programmes were updated. Uh, there is some slippage in terms of the rail station at Barhead, generally uh, out with our control at the moment, but we are working with Network Rail and all of the suppliers to bring that on to fruition as quickly as possible. We move on to number four, which is the Housing Capital Programme. Any questions or amendments or comments? Happy? Item number five, the Barhead Foundry Refurbishment. Again, any questions or comments? Okay, happy with that? Yeah. So as I said at the start of the meeting, I would propose now to take item 15 on the agenda papers at this point. So the report in front of you at item 15 on financial controls is for noting. It sets out the roles and responsibilities of officers and members for the financial management of the council, including reporting arrangements for financial and audit matters. Again, it is for noting. Does anybody want to raise any questions on that? Okay, can we approve that report for item 15? Thank you for that. And um, we now move on to... Okay. Thank you. We, we had a series of failures in our financial controls about 18 months ago where the news that the council was paying for dead people's care packages was leaked to the media. The council lost several hundred thousand pounds because the quality of the agreements with the providers were also so poorly drafted we could not reclaim the money through the courts. So looking at this episode in isolation, it was a double failure. It of course was not an isolated incident. What was also unacceptable was that councillors found out about the above in the papers. Like my colleagues of all parties and none, I felt that this was no way to be informed about significant council financial failures, and like my colleagues felt that this should not happen again. I think we could all still agree this is not how we would want to hear bad news. Audit Scotland's best value audit, which is in the papers in front of us, suggests that councillors should challenge decisions more. 
and they should be challenged not in closed rooms but in public. And it's tough to do that when information is not forthcoming. It is impossible when information is withheld. I would also like to put colleagues in the picture as to how bad things were and indeed continued to be for a long time after the newspaper debacle and to some extent still is. The failure was not an isolated incident at all. Please also let me be clear, you know, we all make mistakes, it's human to make mistakes, but I'm not going to describe simple mistakes, I'm going to describe some poor judgement and consistently very poor choices that run against the best interests of the council, our residents and also advice, which is admittedly post hoc from Audit Scotland. The credit control function has been in four departments in four years. Many positions have been filled with temps because as the department drifted, people left. You know, the worse it got, the more people left, and the more people left, the worse it got. It was not a good place to work, and that precipitated a cycle of failure. Some key standard operating procedures were not written down, and because people came and went, no one really had a tight grip on what was required or how things should be done or even what checks were to be made and how they were to be made. Our internal auditor made recommendations that management accepted and they were still not followed. The list of poor practice is long and lacking. If I've left anything out, I wouldn't be surprised because this was not good. Frankly, any semblance of financial control was illusory. For four years, we had a team that had been pushed from pillar to post and for four years we have had regularly, fairly regular failures in our financial controls. The root cause of this was, and let's call a spade a spade, was repeated, consistent and continued management failure against almost every critical element of that department's management. So I, I guess, I imagine that's why the best value audit made the recommendations it made. At the principal failure was by management and by management not fronting up how bad things were. I would prefer to blame politicians, but we are where we are. That mistakes were made and still, and indeed still are being made should come as no surprise to anyone. We have had two significant mistakes in the last month, or maybe more because I haven't checked in the last couple of weeks. At best this is awful management and consistently inconsistent management and it went on year after year. Not only have we been paying for things we didn't get, and paying for things twice, and paying the wrong people, but for a while we barely paid anyone at all. Clearly someone realised that if we didn't pay anyone we wouldn't get it wrong. Businesses that supplied us were having to take out loans to pay their staff, and some were in danger of going under. Some people think, may think I'm exaggerating, I promise you I'm not. Bad management happens, but we are told only a couple of weeks ago, or we were told only a couple of weeks ago, the part of the solution was stability, and I buy that. The other key component of the solution was better systems, especially IT, and I recognise that some significant improvements have been made by the Deputy Chief Executive and Head of Service. What is a bit galling, though, is that having checked the IT budget, and it's in the capital programme, and I didn't raise it because I'll raise it here, is that I found that having set aside a budget of £200,000 to fix this, only 135,000 of that is proposed to be spent on systems this year and two-thirds of what was deemed to be required. And thus far, this year, and we're eight months in, 12.5% of the proposed budget to fix things has been spent. So having identified a key area that will help fix the dreadful state of our credit control department and to get our financial systems fixed and then not implementing the fix is not really great. After the last public debacle, I assumed maybe rightly, wrongly, if there were any more significant failures, we as councillors would be informed. I thought I'd been given that assurance, but the Chief Executive was kind enough to advise that assurance was not ministered anywhere, so I'm, I can only assume it, it wasn't given. I just assumed it had been given. I cannot imagine why I would not have believed that we would not be informed, because anything else would be inconceivable to most people. So I checked. I asked some people. Was it inconceivable? I asked people from other councils. I asked other officials, even some officials within this council, and they all thought it was inconceivable. So I think it's quite interesting to note that we, I think, are out of step with other councils. Yet here we are. And I put a motion in front of us because we can't, I didn't feel we could rely on us to get a timely, to get timely information when things have gone wrong. The paper we've got in front of us is what we are already doing pretty much. It doesn't provoke change 
but we got a report from Audit Scotland that, that as seeks change, those who were here before the last election will remember with tedious regularity I would bring up two things. The council doesn't listen and cite, cite examples of that and the council is financially incompetent and cite examples of that. And that was at almost every single meeting. So who would have thought that I and my colleagues might have been interested in the whopping failure in our financial controls that transpired six weeks before an election. So let's just rewind. The failure was for £2.3 million. Pounds. I know you are. To make any comment you might want to make, can you please bring it to a conclusion? I will wrap you have a question. I, do, I, I think do. you're supporting the paper, if I understand you I correctly. I am supporting the paper. Well, that's fine. We can make it a bit briefer, I think. Thank you. So let's be absolutely clear. The only reason for the motion I proposed that was that we, we, we wanted to be informed more frequently, more regularly, and in an open, transparent way. I think I'll cut to the chase. I further propose, I, I really propose that if councillors had known just how utterly awful things were in that department, and I don't think anybody did, we would have insisted upon change earlier. That is the nub of my problem. My problem with this council is not the, the management practice that I mentioned although it's not great, it's the, it's the culture of secrecy, the backroom deals, the lack of transparency that a department could be passed from pillar to post that it could fail so spectacularly in so many areas without anyone even really knowing about it. That's my problem. And I'm really glad that the Best Value Audit supports my opinion. If this was a great council or even a good one, management would have approached elected members early, advised that there was a problem, advised what they proposed to do about it, Instead, much of this remained hidden until it, people wrote to us complaining that they couldn't be paid. Councillor Wallace raised that at the council. The newspapers raised that we were paying for dead people's care. That's no way to, that's no way to do things. We, as opposition councillors, only find out things through serendipity often. That's not right. This is a secretive place where planning objections are intentionally not published and where material information has a, on occasion only selectively been given to elected members. The reason for me withdrawing the motion, and this is, this is me concluding. Thank you. The re I recognise the best value audit does change things, or it should. There are no hard and fast timelines on members being informed of failures, but there are still issues around transparency, honesty, quality of management practice, and frankly judgement that for me all point to the need to be more transparent. It's there in black and white, it's a recommendation, and I hope, beyond hope, that we as a council will at last practice good, sound management and reasonable, informed decision-making by elected members. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your support of the paper, Councillor Swift. Uh, does anybody else have any comments to make on it, Councillor Devlin? So I didn't quite hear you, Councillor Devlin. I'm saying, is that your teeth get breaking and there's something wrong with that microphone? It's a terrible sound. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we'll accept the paper um, and move on. Now, there is another uh, motion on the agenda, again uh, put forward by yourself. Um, before we go to that, I'll invite Councillor Buchanan to say a few words. Yeah, thank you, Provis. Yeah, as uh, Councillor Swift is aware, I did apologise to him. Uh, following uh, the meeting, uh, we did have a conversation, and I acknowledge that, and I'm happy to state that I'm happy to apologise again. If you're happy with, with that, I suggest you might want to withdraw that motion as well, Councillor Swift. Provost, I, I am happy with that. Uh, I will withdraw the motion. What I would like to say was I did go to Councillor Buchanan's room, and I did seek an apology. He offered me an apology, and he said that, as everything I say is a lie, uh, <laughs> that was fine. Everything I had said was a lie in that meeting. Because I, don't, I think that's a really qualified apology, so I didn't see that as a, as a reasonable apology, and I'm happy to accept what I've been told tonight, though. Okay, we'll accept it and move on. It's Christmas, spirit of goodwill. Um, moving on then to item number nine, which is the province engagements, which is for noting. Um, item ten, um, statements by conveners or representatives on joint boards. 
Councillor Balfour, you have uh, a statement from the HSCP. Thank you, Provost. Our last integration joint board meeting was on the 29th of November. Hopefully members will already be aware that we have a new opportunity to extend the number of services offered at Bonneton. Uh, Bonneton has their own here, care home in East Renfrewshire, which was previously offered for sale. The changes to NHS continuing care regulations and guidance will mean that a reduction in NHS continuing care beds across Greater Glasgow and Clyde, with funds being transferred to the HSCPs. This offers us in East Renfrewshire the possibility to plan for a different future for Bonneton. The Integration Joint Board agreed to further work on a proposal for Bonneton that retains some care home beds, along with beds for intensive rehabilitation and post-hospital discharge care. It also includes the creation of a six-bed palliative care unit to provide the highest standards of end-of-life care locally in East Renfrewshire. The proposal is that this flexible new service will be provided by our existing Bonneton staff and supported by our experienced community rehabilitation and nursing teams. Over the next few months, HSCP will work with GPs, geriatricians and others to further develop the model and identify training and investment requirements. Work with the Care Inspectorate will also now take place to ensure they are satisfied that the new service is appropriately registered and staffed to deliver the service. A further paper to allow more detailed discussion will be brought back to the IGB in, early, in April next year. These ambitious proposals could see Bonneton become a centre of excellence for high quality support to older residents in East Renfrewshire. This is great news for existing Bonneton House residents and staff, as well as for a much wider group of East Renfrewshire residents requiring, requiring complex support and care who would also benefit from these proposals. Along with this exciting paper, the Board was also updated on community planning in East Renfrewshire, including the fairer East Rain and locality plans. We also heard about moving forward together, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's transformational strategy programme. As we move forward to develop our own strategic plan for the health and social care partnership, these are important developments that will inform our priorities and contributions. Thank you. Thanks, Lord That is indeed good news, and I'm sure we would all welcome that. We don't normally take uh, any questions on it as a statement, but uh, it's, I'm, it's Christmas, and I'm happy to liberal as I can. Thank you, Provost. I would just like to say, say I'm absolutely stunned that you're saying that this is such a fantastic uh, new facility for, for East Renfrewshire, because Bonneton, as you've talked about, is a, a fantastic centre of excellence for elderly people. Bonneton has been that way for the last 20 years, and I'm delighted that it is now continuing on. And if it hadn't been for the local people in Blisby and, the, and, and Clarkson over the last 18 months, two years, fighting to keep Bonneton open, Bonneton would have been sold off and we wouldn't have had it. To, 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 to become a, a future centre of excellence. So it's fantastic news. Right. Yeah, it's good news. Uh, I really don't want to be political, but I mean, had we be accepted the Conservatives' amendment of a few years ago, it would have been closed long ago. So I really don't think it's appropriate to make those sort of uh, political appointments. Move on, it's good news. I think it's something we can reasonably all welcome. Councillor O'Kane. Thank you, Provost. Um, perhaps um, briefly, just to acknowledge from an education point of view since our uh, last meeting that we've had the great pleasure to officially open two of our, our new schools in East Renfrewshire. On um, the 8th of November, we opened the new St Clair's and Caldwood Lodge Primary School and Caldwood Lodge Nursery School, which obviously is the first um, shared campus uh, of its nature in the world, we believe. Uh, it was an, an excellent official opening that was attended indeed by the Chief Rabbi and Bishop John Keenan and many members from across the chamber, from all sides of the chamber, were able to participate in that event, um, which was uh, a very vibrant event led indeed by the children and young people of both of those schools. This morning we had the pleasure of opening the new um, Crookfer Primary, which has been extensively remodelled and refurbished, and indeed its brand new nursery class, which will provide excellent opportunities uh, for the young people in that area. So just to really put on record our thanks to all those who were involved in both of those events uh, and to wish those school communities well for the future. Thank you, Provost. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, again, more very good news, uh, Councillor O'Kane, and events I think um, hugely enjoyed by um, people who were there and very much appreciated by the local community. 
Um, can we then, no other statements I believe, move on to item number 11, which is appointments to committees and boards. Um, I would invite a nomination to fill the vacancy on the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. Can I before yes. Councillor Jim Swift, please? That's with the same Councillor Swift that resigned recently, yes. yes. Okay, okay. Are there any other nominees? Okay, we'll duly accept Councillor Swift back on to the Audit Committee. Look forward to your uh, long-term participation this time. Thank you. Bet I do, yeah. Okay, we shall move on then to... Yeah. Item 13, which is the Culture and, Le and Leisure Trust 2018-19 Business Plan. Um, this seeks approval for the business plan, um, subject of course to the Council's budget, which will be approved in February of next year. And again, elected members have had the opportunity um, of the information session earlier today, and grateful for members of the, the Leisure Trust for coming along and providing that presentation, so they're all suitably well informed, but happy to take any questions or comments on the business plan. Councillor Swift. I'd just like to ask Mr McCreevy if he thinks he's got enough money to do the job that he sets out to do. Has he got adequate resources from the council? That's a horrible question. Well, a yeah, rhetorical question perhaps. Well, I, I would always like more, obviously, but then I, who wouldn't? Um, I think the more important thing is that obviously we've got the relationship with the council to be able to reflect on what is always a changing environment. Um, clearly, when the trust was established, assumptions were made, as they had to be in terms of the outline business case. Some of those have turned out to be true, some less true, but it was always going to be about proving the concept uh, and assessing how we operated in a changing environment, both in terms of the trust um, the competition has obviously changed, and we've talked about that in a previous session this time last year, but clearly, of course, for the Council, and we recognise that the envelope in which we're all operating is only going in one direction. So, um, <clears throat> fortunately, we've got the kind of relationship with the, the Council that is open, supportive and constructive, and we're able to then discuss any things that come uh, up that are unforeseen. So, yeah, we're comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four, which is the East Renfrewshire Council Best Value Assurance Report. Um, this has been a long and tortuous process for ourselves, as it is with every council um, that's audited. Um, there is an action plan and monitoring arrangements, so I'm happy to, to invite uh, any questions or comments that anybody has on the Audit uh, Scotland's report and indeed on the recommendations therein. And, uh, do you want to say anything? I'll t invite Councillor Buchanan in to kick off the Yeah, the thank debate. you, Provost. Yeah, as you said, uh, this has been a long and arduous process uh, from in many aspects. However, I think it's also been a process which has highlighted a number of very good strengths uh, that the Council has. And if I can you know, just touch on some of the points, uh, I think it's been noted in the value report that East Renfrewshire Council continues to go from strength to strength. The Council has performed well since the last audit in 2005 uh, and overall uh, provides an assurance to residents and the Accounts Commission that the, the Council is continuing to achieve best value. I think there are a number of, as we all know, of sector leading practices with very strong performances across our area, education but one of those. And one of the main highlights has obviously been the continued improvement of the children's services and education from an early, already high performance level. We have still managed to continue to improve, which is really uh, saying something. We obviously, it's been noted that there is a clear vision and strategic direction for East Renfrewshire, and that's recognised as, again, another very positive. There have generally been good working relationships between the councillors and the council's corporate management team and a very positive way of working, uh, which has been noted again in the best value report. 
And obviously we can't be complacent. There are the recommendations within the report, which I think we all acknowledge. There are some areas highlighted in future years, which we are continuing to monitor. And as budgets become tighter, they become all the more relevant and all the more pertinent. We obviously have the issue in terms of our own scrutiny of papers, which we do, but equally there's an a aspect there where there continues to be improvement and we can look towards improvement and indeed one of the issues will be to ensure that councillors receive adequate training in terms of scrutiny and that can be put in place and I understand that will be in place by uh, early in the new year, probably from the end of January that will start to happen. So we are looking at those things. We acknowledge the recommendations that are there. Some of them are in some respects overtaken by events already. We are already consulting on a three-year budget. We are looking at the long-term planning that we have and that we really realistically must do over the next few years. So I think overall a lot of credit has to go to our staff who have worked extremely hard during this period, not only continuing with the Council and its normal day-to-day -day running, but managing the whole process of the Audit Commission having been in. And some of us have attended uh, meetings with the Audit Commission and highlighted our concerns and the respect of that. But clearly, we will use the findings to build an, an already strong position. We will continue to monitor that to ensure that we will always look to continually improve where we can. And again, I'd like to thank all of the staff who have been involved in it, the staff who have worked extremely hard delivering the services over the last few years throughout a, a period where austerity has been one of the drivers that's been forced upon us, but we have continued to deliver those services for the benefits of our residents. And indeed, to thank uh, the organisations that we work with, again, across our community planning partnerships, who have worked very well with us in delivering on many of our outcomes. I'd also like to thank our external auditors, who, again, it was an intensive period for them as well, coming in. There was a huge amount of information that they had to gather, and we have worked with them over this lengthy process. Hopefully, the process of the Audit Commission will improve in future years. We will make comment on that in order to try and guide them in terms of what they should be looking for and how we go forward, but equally acknowledge the recommendations that they have made and take that forward. But I think overall, we were certainly very pleased to note that it's a very good best value audit, that we continue to make improvements in the recognition that we are already a top performing council and remain so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Buchanan. We'll open up for comments, Councillor Ray. Hi there. I just want to draw our attention uh, to page 179 of the committee papers. Um, it's basically, this, this is the, the recommendations, as I understand, of uh, Audit Scotland. You just see your paragraph 22 at the bottom. They, they make a point of, of uh, saying the following. There is frequently, frequently limited debate by councillors at meetings of the council and the cabinet. Scrutiny by councillors often takes place out with established meeting structures through informal meetings with officers and presentations and verbal updates to councillors. This reduces the transparency of councillors' challenge and decision making. Councillors should provide greater challenge and scrutiny, particularly during this period of significant change in the council and the need to secure savings from either reductions in the workforce cuts in services or the successful delivery of the business transformation programme. My first question is, given what we've just read there in Audit Scotland's report, um, why has the Chief Exec not given us any firm commitment to tell all councillors of any attempted fraud against the council? How can we possibly carry out our job as recommended by Audit Scotland if some certain information has been withheld uh, as regards attempted fraud against the council? That's the first question. Go to second question. I would caution you about naming individuals or making allegations. This is about a, a, an audit report. It's a very positive audit report overall, but I'd recognise there are recommendations. Is there comments specifically on the audit report that you want to, to well, raise, Councillor Aiken? I think, I've, I think I've already asked my question. Um, we've had recommendations from Audit Scotland about full transparency, and yet it's a, it's a statement of fact. Uh, you're, you're asking me to caution what I say. 
is a statement of fact. The Chief Executive hasn't given us any firm commitments about when we are councillors are told about attempted fraud against the council. Councillors are getting the dart for months at a time. I don't think that's the case, but well, uh, that's what and, I, and, I, and I don't think that's what the audit is in any way, shape or form saying. But I will allow the Chief Executive to respond if she wishes. Could you just clarify the paper that was put in front of Council earlier, which was to clarify the existing procedures? At that point, I was clarifying with, um, in consultation with Section 85 Officer and the Chief Auditor what the existing procedures were. That paper was accepted by Council. Okay, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, I, would, I would just add to... Um, not in particular to what Councillor Aitken was alluding to, but just um, it does seem increasingly an overwhelming sense um, to me that there's a default position that we move things along far too quickly within this chamber and we should be f fleshing out constructive debate as far as I'm concerned for as long as possible. I don't think we do that. I think there's too many situations where the debate has moved along far too quickly um, and I feel that people should have a constructive opportunity to offer as many opportunities to comment on any particular agenda item as far as it goes. Well, I, we operate under um, our standing orders and uh, you know, we, we, there are some councils I do accept that start their business at 9 in the morning and finish at 8 at night are not necessarily the best councils or the best run councils. It's one way of doing business. It's not a way that we've ever operated here. We operate under strict standing orders. And I have to say, I think I've been very liberal this evening in allowing people to actually say what they want to say. That's my style. That's my structure. I have no wish um, to cut any councillor off if they have a contribution to make at a council debate. But there is always a balance of allowing people to make a contribution and frankly not having council meetings that last from nine in the morning to um, you know late in the evening. I'm, I'm, cer I'm certainly not suggesting that we have meetings that last that long. What I would say is that in terms of how often I come here to meet for a full council meeting, we're talking about every five to six weeks and as far as I'm concerned I want to give my constituents value for money in the sense that I'd like to come out here and, and have a very lengthy debate on some of the topics but I feel personally that we move things along far too quickly in this chamber and I'll stand by that Point of view, I, I won't repeat what I've just said Councillor Aiken If I could just respond um, obviously we were happy to pass item number item number 15 because something is better than nothing but I'd just like to point out we don't actually have any specific time frame as to when councillors are supposed to be told about significant items of attempted fraud against the council. Uh, that, the, I suppose if you want a question, the question is, you know, how many days, weeks or months uh, have to elapse before councillors are told? Because as far as I can see, the discretion remains with the chief exec to leave us, leave us hanging for months before we're told about it. Councillor, I, I don't intend to reopen the debate and uh, an item 15 on the financial controls. The opportunity was there for any councillor um, to make any comments if they weren't happy with the paper. It was passed unanimously. Um, we are talking about here what is a very positive best value I'll audit the report of the council. I'll so the is there any question on the actual best value audit that councillors yeah. want to, to make? Wallace. Uh, thank you, Provost. Just a comment. Uh, I'd like to um, give my um, thanks to the best audit people that came in uh, to, to actually carry out the audit. Um, they gave everybody uh, a huge amount of their time to get an overview of what was going on. Uh, I'm delighted to see that they have um, the supported uh, recommendation that increased officer support to the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. Um, I've certainly found my experience that um, a lot of responsibility fell on a very few uh, shoulders and officer support would make a tremendous difference uh, to the task that is given to the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. But I think secondly is just to remind every councillor in the chamber that everybody in this um, organisation as councillors, we are all equally responsible for scrutiny uh, within the chamber. And I have to say, I, I do understand uh, where Councillor MacDonald is coming from, and certainly uh, as a new 
as a new start, if you like, um, is the perception that we need to have um, open debate, we need to understand how decisions are made. Uh, this is one of the few uh, forums that we have is actually very transparent because we are online, as it were. <laughs> Um, but just to, as I say, a reminder to every councillor, we are all equally responsible. It is not just the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. And please don't run away with the idea that because the Audit and Scrutiny Committee um, have, have passed something or whatever, that that means everything is tickety-boo. Um, particularly, if I could just say to the ad administration, the people who are directly involved in policy making, uh, we're behind you uh, in, in terms of making sure that everything is right for, for the council and for our residents. And please give us as much thought as you can to the scrutiny process when you are putting policy together and that uh, management within uh, the organisation are doing what you ask them to do in the first place. That's all. Thanks. Right. Any other comments on uh, Council Lafferty? Uh, no, just briefly... Um, I agree with the points that Councillor Wallace made and regarding the duty of every one of us as councillors. And I think it was the first chairman of the audit committee, Ian Drysdale, who made that remark here in this chamber when we set up the, the system of cabinets, council cabinets, and we were the first in Scotland to do so. But in parallel with that, we had an audit committee that was chaired by members of the opposition and is composed of a majority of opposition members who have the right to raise any matter, investigate anything to do with the council and hold members, conveners uh, and officers to account. But I think it also must be remembered that a lot of the work we do isn't necessarily in this chamber. It's what we can do every day. One of the great powers we have as elected members in East Remshire Council is access to officers <coughs> who we can arrange to meet and discuss and explore details in depth. I, would, I think that often that can be more productive uh, and more informative to members than a, a five-hour council meeting. Thank you, Provost. I'd just like to reiterate more or less what uh, has been said about the, the lack of information coming from uh, officers. And I've spoken to the Chief Executive and the Chief Executive on this in the past. Because there's a lot of things that went on with the Best Value Audit report, the, the amount of work that the CMT did, that we, we, did, I, we knew nothing about at all. And I'd just like to thank the officers for all the work that they did as well. Uh, any other comments? Okay, we note the report, the report is for noting. It was a very detailed audit of the Council. And I would want to say from my own personal perspective as uh, leader of the council at the start of the process, of the audit process, but obviously for quite a period before then, um, it's a very positive report. If you look at the audit reports throughout Scotland, it's one of the best in Scotland. Um, but nevertheless, as auditors do, they always find things that you can do better and we acknowledge that. And uh, where there are areas of weakness, I think everybody has a determination to make it better. But it is a very, very positive audit report. And I would just like to thank the staff, largely, who have delivered it. Um, you know, obviously, as elected members, we like to take credit for things. But these, you know, the good performance of the council only happens because we have an excellent workforce. And the excellent workforce have been working year in, year out, to deliver excellent frontline services for the people of East Renfrewshire Council. They've done it in quite difficult circumstances. They've done it recently with declining budgets. I think all of us, whatever party or none that we represent, owe a great deal of thanks to the people who work for East Renfrewshire Council for producing this. And I just would like to put that on record. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I take it, given the comments, we are approving the action plan which is set out in front of you. Okay, thank you. Right, moving on, we've already done item 15. Can I move on to item 16, which is a local development plan um, 2, the main issues report, the consultation. Um, the report in front of you is for noting, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. I just wondered if there's any uh, word in the member of the working group as yet.
Okay, we know it like These people are invariably older, uh, vulnerable, uh, and they have people who have real problems living next door to them. Now, these houses were built originally for older people and should be given to older people and protected for older people. That's one of the things I think we could do that would dramatically improve the quality of lives of older people who live there. And, uh, and you know, most drug addicts still have both their legs and can move around more easily. That's one. Can I continue for another point? Make your point. <coughs> Page 255, 3.6. Uh, across the LDP, uh, or the MIR, we had 808 representations uh, and uh, across 13 different housing sites, and more than half of them were for Broomburn Drive uh, and the park there. Uh, and I, I think it's, 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 it's important to understand that people who live near the park or don't live near the park, but live near enough to the park to know where it is, don't want development there. Mm -hmm. And that includes a leisure centre, frankly, which was not party to the, the local development plan, because uh, certainly hadn't reached the public domain by then. I certainly hadn't even thought of that one. But uh, So if we've got over 50% of objections here to Broomburn Park, I hope we can just take that off the table frankly. And I know that's down to the member or officer working group. It's not down to a decision that we will make here tonight. Pardon me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, the best value audit says that we as a council should, should really listen to our communities. Well, if we're listening to our communities, they made it clear in black and white that that really should be taken off the table. One of the things about Glasgow, um, Glasgow City Fathers protected Glasgow. Uh, from development has, you know, Glasgow's still called the Deer Green Place because it's got more parks than anywhere else in Western Europe. We have that, and I, there are many things about Glasgow that I wouldn't recommend, but I would recommend that we protect our Deer Green Places. And we're already building nurseries on too many of these Deer Green Places. We are not protecting them. And once these places are built upon, there's nowhere else left to go. And I, I appreciate that we have an issue with the amount of property that we actually have in East Renfrewshire that we own, or land that we own, that we can build upon. But we've got to be able to do deals with developers or something, and not build in the core of areas where, if we're not protecting our green lungs, we're, go we're going to kill our communities. We're going to stop East Renfrewshire being the pleasant, decent place that it is to live. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Provost. Councillor Bevan. Your microphone on, Councillor, please. There are a lot of them very vulnerable individuals that don't cause MD any problems, okay? So hopefully you can retract the, the question about drug, ad drug addicts getting homes. Sorry, Councillor Swift, let me finish. It was the Scottish Executive in 2002 that deregulated homes. Basically, there was no age restriction on them. So, basically, 60 and below... It's just it's the one waiting list, there's no age restriction, so anybody can get a house in any property in East Renfrewshire. We brought in uh, a policy with sheltered housing accommodation, you're only allowed to get a house 60 and above. So I wouldn't blame the council, I'd blame the Scottish executive at that time that changed the law.
But I don't think it's productive. You made your point on it to have a debate on what is effectively policy made by the Scottish Parliament. Um, any other comments on the local plan? It is a consultation, and it's a, as I say, the report is for noting. Leader, I can see it is a report for noting. It's an update of the, the MIR, and in time it will, we will have the proposed plan, LDP, coming before this council. Hopefully, once the work's done in the, by the summer next year. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Lafferty. I, I have been asked to, to remind folk I'm not the leader on the province now. So <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> for, for good, for good or ill. Um, <coughs> I'd just like to remind councillors that there's standard commission training on Friday. Um, in Glasgow City Chambers and it will specifically uh, deal with planning issues and what comments councillors should and should not make prior to any planning applications. Just in case any councillors are not aware of this training, I would encourage all councillors to go along. Point well made. Those of us, I think, who like to be able to vote and help our communities really avoid commenting and planning applications, or prospective planning applications, and I would certainly encourage everybody to be careful what they say in the public domain. Councillor MacDonald. Can I just clarify, and maybe you can school me on that, uh, with regards to comments that are being made. Are we talking about people that are on planning, uh, uh, or every councillor? Every councillor, anyone who makes any comments beforehand yep. on well, we won't be good to the whole story again, but there, there is training on Friday by the Standards Commission for all councillors who are, who are uh, allowed to go along and get proper guidance on what they can say, what they can't say, what they can comment on, and that will be held in Glasgow City Chambers. It was offered to all councillors. I'm not sure if you put your name down for it. It was put up uh, about six months ago we were offered it very early on and I've encouraged all councillors to go because I wouldn't like it to be the case that depending on what the next MIR, uh, sorry, the next LDP says, I wouldn't like there to be some councillors excluded from voting. Comments <laughs> on the paper, Councillor? 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Glasgow Six Chambers. Provis, just to clarify that um, I can, if any other of the councillors who've said that they weren't go or who didn't notify that they wanted to go are now interested in going, please speak to me tomorrow and I'll get back to the Commission. They did ask us to finalise our numbers, which we've already done. Um, so I'd need to go back to them to see if there are still any spaces available. So please, if you are interested, now give me a, give me a call tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay, can we approve uh, or note the item at uh, number 16 and move on to item 17, which is the review of budgeting. Again, the report is for noting. I'm uh, happy to take any questions or comments on it. Okay. Approve that. And moving on to item 18, the review of Treasury Management Practices and the policy statement. Uh, again, seeking approval this evening for the, the revised practices and policy statement contained therein. Any questions or comments on that one? <coughs> Thank you, Provost. Uh, page 292.3132A, uh, uh, um, in respect of borrowing and other funding decisions, the Council will consider the ongoing revenue liabilities created and the implications for the organisation's future plans and budgets. Whilst obviously we do that, I think it would be much more useful if, in, like for example, we're talking about uh, leisure centres and things like that, it would be important to put across the, the, the revenue liabilities created for capital. Uh, plans because in, in every report we do, ha I know there was some information there about you know the revenue that it would it potentially, each of the options would potentially generate, but I, I do think it is important to have that kind of number in the paper. Want to say anything on that, Mrs. McCrossan? 
Thank you, Provost. Uh, just to give the assurance that part of our uh, appraisal process for new capital bids involves um, option appraisal, it involves how we assess whether a project aligns with council priorities, it ties in with the asset management plan, and one of the other critical factors is both the capital costs and indeed the revenue consequences of that project. In addition to that, the, the direct revenue consequences of, for example, opening and running a new facility are one element, which would be in the departmental budgets. We factor those in when we're doing budget planning on the revenue side, but also um, we take account of the total impact on the capital plan, not so much as a, on a project-by-project project basis for uh, funding, because we don't fund projects individually. We look on it as um, total funding for the capital plan, so whether that is um, overall uh, met from capital reserves or loan charge funding, it's seen as a total. But any incremental impact of the capital plan year on year is then factored into the loan charge calculations for the revenue budget. And which, which paper are you? Somebody's putting forward something for... If something, is, if something is coming forward as a proposal to the Council and it has a capital cost, the revenue, I would like to see the revenue implications for that, you know, so that people can understand the opportunity cost for revenue, really, basically. Um, any, any of the capital plans which are proposed at the Council meeting to go forward and be added into the new, the new Year's programme? The revenue consequences of those have been built into departmental budgets that go up to the same meeting. And also the Prudential Indicators report that goes to the same meeting will have rolled up all the total um, funding impacts as well. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll approve that report. Item 19 is the name of the new community hub in Auchenbach. Um, I'm actually delighted again, one of the nice, very nice agenda items here this evening, um, to be able to present this paper to the Council. Um, the new centre in Auchenbach is taking a wee while to come to fruition, I think it's fair to say, um, but something which is at all party support in the Council, and something which I think we've all recognised is very, very necessary in that particular part of East Renfrewshire Council. Um, the name is to be named after uh, Sir Harry Burns, and it's particularly appropriate because uh, not only with Sir Harry's um, background um, within Scottish Government and the very good work he did for Scottish Government, he's also a local resident and a freeman, as you know, of East Renfrewshire. But he took um, particular time and care to actually help with the design um, of the project, and given his many duties, uh, which he had on his plate, which are national duties at the time, we're very, very grateful for the considerable amount of time and effort that Sir Harry was able to give us in terms of designing the facility and uh, ensuring that the outcomes which we all want um, will, in fact, be delivered. So it's particularly pleasing, I think, to be able to name um, the facility after such a distinguished gentleman who is uh, currently, as you know, a Freeman of East Renfrewshire. I hope it's getting unanimous support within the Council, and I would certainly commend um, to the Council today that this new very important facility is named the Sir Harry Burns um, Centre. Up here. Okay. It's great. Thank you very much for that. my mic on, have you my, your permission to exclude the press and public? Okay, thank you very much. So I have to ask the members of the gallery to leave. No, you can't ask, uh, I, I, you have to leave the gallery at this point. I've passed, uh, I have asked for permission, it's been unanimously approved, there is no vote, I must ask the gallery to be cleared have to leave the gallery, Mr. Jason, I'm sorry. Can I just uh, interject there? You just said that you, it wasn't unanimously approved. It wasn't unanimously approved. I don't approve of it. 
Um, the reason why is I want to ask, and I was hoping that Jerry Mahan would be here tonight, because I wanted to ask him specifically, is it against the law to discuss what we're going to discuss without the press and public being here? And I think if the answer to that question is a flat no, then we should proceed with the press and public in the gallery. That's my view. For Bailey to clarify it, but I wish to know, are you moving against it? Because you didn't at the time when I asked for permission to... Well, with all due respect, you very quickly scanned your eyes across the chamber and you didn't really get a consensus from everybody. I would like it noted in the minutes that I do not agree to this. Um, I also I also don't agree, I am. Um, just without wanting to quote again, no, yeah, on, on, on it's Scotland, it, it's the arguing for more scrutiny. This, the canality of scrutiny, if we're basically clearing the gallery and uh, not allowing the press uh, and the people to actually hear what's been said tonight. So this, this basically goes against what Audit Scotland's told us. So I, I also don't agree well, with the motion. That's your view. If you wish to move against it, you're free to move against it. That's the, the, the procedure. We'll go to a vote on it. I am moving against it. Okay, what, what's your motion then, that we allow the... Yes, that we allow the press. Do you have a second for that? Second. Okay. Can, can, I, can, I, can I also... No, I, I am making then the motion to exclude the press and public. Can, Just for the records, can I have a second for that? Councillor Buchanan. Can, can I also suggest, prior to going to a vote, that we vote by poll, please, and have it minuted in the records as to how each councillor votes on this specific subject matter? Because I think it's important that the public are aware as, who, as to who votes for this and who votes it down. Well, there is a procedure for calling for a roll call vote. I'll pass to Mr Bailey, who will explain all that to you. Yeah, thank you, Provost. For, for us to call, uh, for people to determine how they voted by individual, we need to have a roll call vote, and for that we need three <coughs> members to call for the roll call vote. So we can have three members who are happy to support a roll call vote. One, two. You're voting for something you've got approved? No, I don't have to vote. Provost, I'd maybe just like to clarify for, in relation to Councillor Macdonald's comments about what he would like and what we would not like minuted. Uh, preparation of the minutes is an operational matter which is dealt with by officers and if, uh, if members are unhappy with the content of the minute, they have the opportunity to challenge that when the minutes are pre presented to the next meeting of the Council. Um, Provost, we do have a motion and an amendment in relation to the exclusion of the press and public. Um, the motion by yourself, seconded by Councillor Buchanan, is that the press and public be excluded for, from the meeting for this next item. The amendment by Councillor Macdonald, seconded by Councillor Aitken, is that the press and public are not excluded from the meeting. Uh, I will call the roll in alphabetical order. So, Councillor Aitken, for the motion or amendment. I'm really just going to go to the vote, and it's quite straightforward. Right. Councillor Aitken? I've obviously already seconded uh, Councillor McDonald's motion, so, yeah, uh -huh, I agree. Councillor Bamforth? I disagree with the amendment. I vote against the amendment. Councillor Buchanan, motion or amendment? Motion. Councillor Convery? Motion. Councillor Devlin? Motion. Provost Fletcher? Uh, motion. Councillor Gilbert? Councillor Grant? Motion. Councillor Ireland? Motion. Councillor Lafferty? Motion. Councillor Macdonald? Amendment. Councillor McLean? Amendment. Councillor Merrick? Motion. Councillor Miller? Motion. Councillor O'Kane? Motion. Councillor Swift? Motion. Councillor Wallace? Motion. 
Provost, the vote was 14 for the motion and 3 for the amendment. The motion has been declared carried and the Council has agreed to resolve to exclude the press and public for the next item. So I'm trying to be as polite as I can and ask the gallery um, to please leave. We've passed the motion. Um, I have the power to suspend the meeting and call the police, and the police would clear the gallery. I would rather it doesn't come to that. Okay.